I'm going to talk over the next 15 minutes or so about the global medical device and diagnostic market. And in the context of how do we think about our product life cycle and what the changing uh, geographic and uh, regulatory landscape means to that. So I'm going to try to talk about this. Obviously, this topic, I mean, either, any single one of these, whether talking about the, uh, the approaches, the uh, clinical strategic approaches to the global market, the medical device market itself, regulatory changes, any one of these would be easily a full day meeting itself. So really just going to talk about all of these on a very macro level scale uh, to get us thinking again about do we need to reconsider what has been the standard? Oops, going the wrong way. So here's kind of been the traditional approach, and, and I'm generalizing here. There's certainly uh, many divergent potentials here as to what's been done typically in the past, but a very common model has been simply to take your device, go get a CE mark, uh, because that was, has been the least cost effective, the least burdensome, and get into that market with that CE marking. Uh, once commercialized there, maybe produce revenue, maybe you don't, but you've got a product on the market, right? Uh, with that commercialization, if you're producing revenue, you may then get into uh, using that revenue to run post-market studies in Europe, producing clinical evidence that then can help into other geographies, uh, run a U.S. study, uh, getting into the U.S. market. But the point here is being it was a very linear process. Uh, you picked a geography, you went into it, and once you got it there, then you tried to di uh, diverge from there. Now with some of the things we're going to talk about in the next few minutes, when you look at the changing regulatory landscape, when you look at uh, the changing uh, growth uh, across different geographies, it's, we really should be thinking about this as not such a linear thought process. Uh, there's reasons in certain geographies that it's becoming more burdensome to get approvals. There's uh, other areas that regulations are becoming a bit easier. Uh, the geographic uh, growth rates are shifting. So again, we'll go through this and wonder, is there a different way of doing this? Uh, rather than such a linear process, look at, uh, can we do this in parallel? Uh, should there be geographies that we should be focusing on over others? Uh, so I kind of talked about this already as, as to the why, uh, the regulatory changes, the changing markets, uh, et cetera. So on a very macro scale, over the next few years, this is what our medical device industry looks like. Starting to approach $440 billion, the market's still primarily consumed uh, by North America at about 50%, that in and of itself uh, being the United States. The big difference is Asia Pacific and Europe. Europe, for as long as most of us can remember, was a standby number two. You knew that if you went into Europe, you had a solid market, you were golden there until you were able to figure out typically how to get into the United States. But now with Asia Pacific uh, very quickly encroaching on uh, Europe's uh, market share, and by some analysts in only a handful of years will surpass Europe's share, uh, maybe we need to think about what that means to our strategy. The market as a whole, 5.1% 5 5 growth over the next uh, eight years or so, fairly typical of what we've seen. That, that hasn't really changed a lot. Uh, but what has changed are two primary geographies. Europe uh, projected about 1.3% annual growth, and really that might even be optimistic because some analysts are even seeing a potential regression at negative 1.5% in that geography. So that's a huge shift. So what's your return on investment uh, going to Europe compared to, say, China looking at 10%? And that and I don't even know if we can really trust that number because a white paper that uh, our group put together recently or a few years ago, that was at seven and a half, eight percent. And it seems like every analyst report that comes out every year, that number keeps going bigger and bigger. The point at which they uh, surpass uh, Europe in the market comes up sooner, and people are already starting to talk about at what point do they surpass North America. So very quickly growing market uh, that all again drives into uh, what should our be a strategy for our product life cycle? As part of that, there's a shift in uh, a lot of the therapeutic markets. I'm not going to go into these in detail. Um, I'm assuming all of you know your individual therapeutic markets well, but when you look at some of the standbys that have been around for us for a long time, such as aesthetics, uh, that is growing very quickly uh, compared to what it has historically for various reasons. Uh, cardiac and vascular, um, it's always going to be a staple, significant market. Uh, 
And then digital health, I mean, who knows what that's going to do with, with the potential there. But the point of this slide isn't so much the focus of the therapies, is that within all of these different geographies, there's uh, many different uh, therapies to be able to focus on. All right, so we've talked about the geographic changes. It starts to get us thinking about, all right, well, great. Europe is slowing down, the US is the same, China is going faster, but can I actually get to market in any one of these geographies and which from a strategic standpoint will actually benefit my organization? So for Europe, uh, I think all of us are familiar with the new regulations. There's white papers that come out pretty much every day. Uh, I'm not gonna try to explain what those changes are, except for the, the top level summary is, most of these changes are gonna increase your time and increase your cost of getting CE marketing and going to Europe. In a geography that is seen a slowing, if even a regression in the overall market size. So, as part of that, the notified bodies, much more difficult to work with going forward. There's gonna be fewer of them. They're gonna be resource tight. More companies going to the same notified bodies. And particularly if you don't currently have one, it's gonna be that much more difficult to get into one. They're gonna have their standby customers, their priorities. Uh, so if you are going to Europe and you don't have a committed notified body, it really needs to be one of your top priorities at this point is figure out who are you gonna work with and what is their uh, model gonna be going forward uh, as these new regulations come into play. At some point I'll get this clicker right. Uh, classification change is also gonna be uh, impact your strategy in Europe. Many devices are getting uh, reclassified or upclassified, particularly those getting upclassified is gonna result in additional clinical evidence needs. Uh, again, driving up costs, driving up timelines. Uh, most ex affected, uh, from what we can tell now, are gonna be diagnostics. Uh, in Europe currently, maybe about 20% or so require notified body intervention, meaning maybe 20% uh, need to produce some type of clinical evidence. With the new regulations that are taking place over the next uh, three to five years, that's getting completely inverse, and roughly about 80% of those diagnostics are gonna need some type of clinical evidence. This is gonna have a huge impact on those companies. Um, I think it'll be really interesting over the years to see how many of those stay in the market, or do their ROI and decide it doesn't make sense for us to try to you know, do clinical evidence and, and be a me too diagnostic. Um, and then not only are they saying more devices need to have clinical evidence, they're saying that clinical evidence has to be better. There has to be uh, a higher bar that all of your evidence has to meet. And all of this, when you look at Europe, all of this driving your cost and your timeline to approval up. Again, in a market that's decreasing. I'm, I'm not trying to say you don't go to Europe. Um, that's certainly your, a business decision. There's still an enormous market in Europe. Uh, but again, thinking about what is your strategy from where do I go first, where do I go in parallel? The automatic of Europe being the first choice is maybe something that many of us uh, are rethinking. Counter to that, and almost opposite of that, when you look at the renewal of the 21st Century Cures Act, Congress really mandated the FDA to almost take an opposite approach. They ma mandated in uh, the Cures Act for certain medical devices to figure out how can you decrease the burden to get approval, looking at such things as uh, alternative statistical models, um, other methods of collecting data, case studies, uh, publication uh, meta-analysis, uh, those type of things to say, uh, surrogate endpoints is a big one that uh, there was a recent meeting on. So what can you do as the FDA to decrease the burden of medical device companies to get to market? Uh, it's the only time will tell as to how the FDA implements some of these, but all of these in theory should decrease the timeline and cost to enter the U.S. market. Uh, the other really interesting one that uh, the Cures Act outlines is a secondary approver. Almost, to kind of oversimplify it, almost a notified body model where not everything has to go through the FDA directly. Uh, they haven't, I haven't seen anything as to how they're actually going to implement that, but the closest hint is to what they're doing with uh, digital health right now or software as medical devices with the pre-certification program, with, which is currently in beta and a handful of companies in which they're saying for certain software medical devices, you as an organization are pre-certified to approve those yourself and just notify us. Um, there's a two-day meeting uh, next week in which the FDA is gonna further outline the rollout and the implementation of this. And I think potentially uh, this might be 
kind of a model as to if they do this for other medical devices, what that could look like. Uh, first and manner feasibility studies. Uh, this isn't really new. Uh, this was rolled out three, maybe four years ago, but a change in guidance documents and processes that really decreases the burden and cost for running first and man and feasibility studies in the U.S. Uh, now, does it still potentially make sense to go elsewhere? There was a good presentation uh, earlier today talking about the benefits of going to Australia. Sure, there's, there's still other geographies where it may make sense to do it there, but what the FDA here has done with the intent of really leveling that playing field and decreasing the burden of doing these studies in the U.S. And there, there can be regulatory and clinical strategies to doing all of your studies in the U.S. if the U.S. market is really your target. So the summary with the U.S., you look at Europe, they're bringing everything up, making everything uh, a bit more burdensome, or at least from a cost and timeline perspective. The FDA, well, maybe not the FDA quite yet, but at least through the Cures Act being mandated to look at how can you decrease that burden. And then uh, China. Uh, uh, there are many people that have run studies in China. Um, it's painful. It's, it historically has been incredibly time consuming, unpredictable. You really, it's, it's difficult to do. So you have this incredibly fast growing market that has been very difficult to enter in a predictable manner. There's intellectual property issues historically. Um, so what the CFDA has done is they came out with 36 initiatives. Um, again, this could be an hour plus talk in and of itself. But from a timeline and as a clinical trialist, the biggest impact has been these initiatives with the intent, what the intent is, among other things, is to bring that first, that time to start up for a study from a year plus to four to five months. So that four to five months, as most of us know, is very much on par with Europe, uh, the US, as to how long it might take to get a site up and running. Um, so this again drives that uh, conversation of, not falling into a crevasse of this is the way it's been done, you go to Europe, you go to the US, then maybe you think about Asia Pacific, the Middle East. It starts to show that China is very aggressive at uh, making it as easy as possible uh, relative to other regulations, other countries, to bring products to market. Uh, the US uh, is doing similar. Uh, Europe, uh, again, not to knock Europe, I think most would say that the CE marketing process for a lot of devices is probably too lax is maybe not the right word, but uh, too, too low of a burden for too long, and I think they're just bringing their bar up. So what this has really done is, when you look at the major geographies, everything is much more level playing field than it was even a few years ago. So as we look at our product life cycle, what makes the most sense for us? And we're not gonna try to define that. There's many variables from your KOL preferences, your investor preferences, but purely from a regulatory and clinical strategy, uh, the, the dynamics are changing quickly, and I think it's important for all of us not to just think too narrowly as to this is how it's always been done. Uh, we'll do it that way going forward. All right, so I think I actually managed to get a three-day talk into about 15 minutes. <laughs> <laughs>